So we will we'll just just start. I think uh, Becky, Becky, you're okay, Becky. I'm good. I'm here. Okay. So uh, I'll just um, well, just good evening, everyone, and uh, thank you for joining us today. My name is Vijaya Kantapuri. I'm the social worker at Ontario Brain Injury Association, and I run the free online confession support. So OBAYA provides education and awareness and support across the province. Before we get started, I just wanted to give you a little bit of information, our free services. Um, OBAYA offers, we have a tall free helpline where callers can get emotional support, advocacy and information about brain injury. And also we have an online confession support groups, which provides the education resources and a place to connect people after confession. And it runs three times a year in our eight week session. And we also offer pre peer support program, which matches survivors with the mentors to provide one on one support over the phone. And also, for those of you who may be working with the pediatric population, we have a training program coming up in October called Children and Youth with the ABI and the Confession. And also we have an upcoming provincial ABI conference from November 6th through the 8th. And all this information is in our website. And now I would like to introduce our presenter, Becky Moran. Becky is a registered occupational therapist at St. Joe's Healthcare in London, Ontario. And Becky has been an occupational therapist since 2006 and has worked in adult mental health hand therapy, stroke rehabilitation, and the brain injury. She's the recurrent guest lecturer at the Western University School of Occupational Therapy. Becky has developed clinical expertise in mild brain injury and the concussion management. She has a passion for educating patients about pacing and planning activities in their day and providing strategies for alternative ways to complete tasks to improve success. And we would like to thank Becky for taking time to present this webinar. And please feel free to submit your questions during the webinar through Q&A chat box. We'll try to answer them during the Q&A time. And with this, I would like to turn it over to Becky. Hi, Becky. Hello, thank you so much for having me. Thank you. I just want to make sure everyone can hear me okay and I'm going to try and speak if anyone knows me I talk kind of fast so I'm going to try and speak extra slow tonight to make sure everyone can understand what I'm saying and follow along with what I'm doing. So thank you so much for having me. We're going to discuss tonight some planning and pacing strategies to help after acquired brain injury or concussion. Uh, as if anyone has seen me present before, some of the material you'll see today will be very similar to what I presented before. Um, some of it may be new but it will be we're all along for the ride together so Buckle up and here we go. So the first thing is, is that brain injury can be caused by many different events. Sometimes brain injuries can be caused by things within our own bodies. So for instance, we can have anoxic brain injuries, infections, strokes, aneurysms, tumors, seizure disorders, different things like that that are within our own body. Other times, our brain injuries can come from things that happen to us, where we're either hit by something in our head or our head itself is hit hit something from a fall or an accident, um, from surgery. And those can be both open and closed head injuries. And open head injury means that your skull was fractured as well. So lots of different ways of having brain injuries. And there's lots of different things that can happen after brain injury as well. So you guys are all living with this. And so I don't need to explain too much about what you're living with. But for those of you who don't have a brain injury, it is, can be quite overwhelming, just the number of symptoms that happen and the purpose of this slide is to show just how overwhelming it can be because there's a lot of stuff going on at once and some of the symptoms that come along with head injury headache dizziness emotional changes visual dysfunction fatigue physical difficulties like balance problems auditory processing disorders cognitive difficulties they don't no one wears a sign that says those things there's just they're very subtle sometimes so if people aren't back at work or they say no to a lot of things or they always have to have a headache or they can't participate anymore so we're really going to focus in on the fatigue aspect and getting back to activities despite having fatigue and having a very low energy or having a lot of symptoms that come along with this injury and the problem basically comes down to when you've had a head injury, your, your brain just has to work extra hard to do simple things. 
easy tasks are a lot more challenging. So this slide just demonstrates how they've done some functional MRIs where they show that brain injured patients, patients even after just a, a concussion, and I say just a concussion, but there's nothing mild about that, right? Concussions can be quite debilitating um, and there's nothing mild about them. But even with a concussion, um, activities take a lot more brain energy. So you can see how without a concussion, only the small areas of the brain light up doing simple cognitive activities or simple motor tasks. But after a brain injury or a concussion, we see that a lot more areas of the brain have to light up. So if you think about every area of the brain lighting up, costing energy or costing fuel in the tank, a lot more fuel is being burned by doing simple activities after a brain injury because the brain just isn't working efficiently. A lot of times it can't find the answers very quickly. It has to reroute or detour around areas that are damaged. So it takes a lot more energy and a lot more um, endurance to get through tasks that used to be very, very easy. That's why a simple thing like coming to a party or going out for dinner at a restaurant used to be fun and easy and now it's a challenge and a struggle. And the other problem is, is that you look normal. Who's been told they look normal, right? No one can see that there's a bandaid on your brain. What you really want them to know is that your brain is in the wheelchair, right? It's not working so well, but it's not on the outside. It's very much an internal injury. And what they see is that you have a headache or they actually don't see you at all because you haven't left your house for a little while. So a lot of times that can happen. We can become very socially isolated with this injury because we can't do a lot of the things we love doing. And so we start to isolate ourselves from other people as well. When I look at my patients, so I work in the Ministry of Health funded program at Parkwood Institute in London. One of like we see a lot of patients come through and the most frequently reported symptoms we see are headache and fatigue. I don't know which one's number one, which one's number two anymore because they seem to flip flop back and forth. But those two things are reported kind of consistently across the board with our patients with mild TBI, concussion and acquired brain injury. Fatigue is a big deal because it can have multiple triggers. Fatigue can be dependent on what medications you're taking, what kind of hormone levels you have right now, your regular sleep routine, or if that's off. Like if people, usually sleep disruption is a common side effect of a head injury. So if your sleep routine is off, then it's really hard to um, feel recharged or refreshed after sleeping at night. Sometimes the weather can impact fatigue, your mood can impact fatigue, um, activity levels, and pre-injury energy levels. So if you, um, were a very energetic person before, it's a big hit to the system when you can't do as much as you used to be able to do as well. Fatigue is important as well because it impacts all activities. There's no turning your brain off. Your brain is always active. Even when you sleep, your brain is doing something. And so having fatigue will impact everything. It's like this black cloud hanging over you and impacting all your tasks that you do. So I, I want to make a difference as well between cognitive fatigue and physical fatigue. They are very different. Um, some patients get back to physical activity. They can jog, they can run, run, they can do cardio stuff, they can rake the leaves, they can mow the lawn, but they can't fill out a form because the cognitive fatigue of filling out, a, I'm going to say, a government form or an insurance form is just too much because it's too difficult. Uh, and then the vice versa can also happen where patients can do lots of cognitive stuff, but physically, any kind of try and do any kind of uh, endurance training or stamina, they, can, they kind of fall apart with physical fatigue. And fatigue is also one of these things that doesn't stay consistent. So it could fluctuate over days, it could fluctuate over weeks, it could fluctuate over months as well. So um, Monday, you might be feeling great, be able to do lots of stuff. Tuesday, Wednesday, not so much. So it becomes a bit of a challenge trying to predict when the fatigue or that wall of fatigue is going to hit because it does fluctuate over the course of even just during a day. Like you could be fine in the morning and crash in the afternoon. Headaches and pain is also a very debilitating thing that can happen. Most of my patients, they report that headaches that they, re that they experience now are very different than the usual headache. They say that it's not like the headaches they used to have before. This usually is a high pressure headache. It feels like there's a pressure inside the head. There's a band of um, pressure or tension across the forehead. It can also have multiple triggers. So people can get headaches from too much light if they're light sensitive, too much screen time. Again, if they're light sensitive and the screen is bright, then we can also have some headache from that. It can come from overstimulation with noise or the visual system. It can come from neck pain. So if your injury involved um, a neck injury with it or a whiplash injury, that can also contribute into the pressure and headache. Um, if your jaw was impacted by your injury or if you now you're super stressed out and so you're clenching your teeth at night, that will also trigger up into headache pain. 
some patients report that they get lots of headaches when they do too much. So um, a lot of our patients are saying that they're doing, they feel like they've overdone it and then they get headaches and then they pay for it later. So then they stop doing activities sometimes as well. And tension and stress. So imagine I always kind of bring my shoulders up to my ears and imagine if you walk around like that because you're under stress because something's happening with finances or there's another fight about your, your symptoms when you're at home. All those things can kind of build up and add to pain and pressure in the headaches as well, in the headache realm. And a lot of our patients, this is their current activity pattern. So when you think of the purple line as your activity levels. So if we start kind of where the, the two, the intensity and the time meet together in the bottom corner, you start your day feeling okay. And as you go along, your activities maybe increase, you start to feel a little bit of symptoms. So you wake up in the morning, you're doing fine. You get breakfast, you're kind of doing okay. You get the kids on the bus, you're not doing okay now because now you're starting to get a little bit of symptoms coming on, but then you have to drive to the doctors go to a doctor's appointment, wait in the waiting room for two hours. And then by the time you've done that appointment, you're toast, you're done. So that we, what happens is that when we had, then we had this crash and burn effect where you kind of hit this wall of fatigue or hit this wall of headache and you can't do much else. So then it takes prolonged amount of time to recover from that. And then a couple of days go by. So you've rested, you've taken Tylenol, you've done everything you need to do to kind of get back in the swing of things. You wake up one morning, you're like, oh, I'm feeling better. I, I can do more again. So you start doing the exact same thing again, where you get up, you have some breakfast, you start to feel, feel it a little bit, you get the kids on the bus, you start to feel it more. And then guess what? You get to drive to another appointment for a massage therapy this time. And then you crash and burn. So a lot of our patients say, yes, this is exactly what I'm doing. I am in this roller coaster of doing way too much, crashing and burning. Please help me stop this. Because if you end up feeling really rotten most of the time, you have significant symptoms for most of the time. And the times that you do feel okay, you're usually trying to rest it off. And there's a lot of common thoughts with this too. People feel that they're not trying hard enough, or I need to push through these symptoms. So they need to work harder, or they need to willpower their way through this. People will think I'm lazy or I feel guilty. Or they feel like they're already not doing anything because they might not be at work or school anymore. And so they feel like they have to contribute somewhere. And so they try and push through and do more at home than they, what they really can do right now. And they go into significant symptoms that way. When you're in the significant symptom zone though, that's the red zone and that's when you don't rest. And it's like your brain is on fire your brain is overheating, your brain is doing too much, and it really is not, it's not conducive to recovery, and you're able, really not able to get much done that's productive either. So if you're in that much pain or that, that tired all the time too, the activities you are participating in, usually you're not doing it 100% either. So you're not doing it very well. What we would prefer to see is something more like this, where you do a little bit of activity. So you go, maybe you get up and have breakfast, you pack the kids, pack the kids' backpacks, but send them out the door to the bus with someone else. And then you take a rest. And then maybe after the rest, then you drive to the doctor's office. And then you rest in the doctor's office with some earplugs in. So you can't hear everyone else talking in the waiting room. And then you rest. And then you do your doctor's appointment. And then before you drive home, you rest in the car and then you drive home. So we try and avoid the really significant, like full on brain burn symptoms. We want to be a little bit uncomfortable. So you have to go into a little bit of symptoms, like mild to moderate. So you want to be a little bit uncomfortable or feel it a little bit, but then take a rest break and recover from that. So a great example is, let's say you go for a walk and you go for an hour long walk. Your headache started at a three. By the time you're finished your walk, your headache's at an eight right now. And it takes you about three or four hours to recover from that, to get back down to three again. So that's probably too much. An hour long walk is probably too much for you because you've gone up way too high in the symptoms and it takes you a long time to recover from that. If let's say you go for a walk for half an hour, you go from a three out of 10 headache to a five out of 10 headache. So maybe two points up and you recover from that in about 30 to 60 minutes. So you, you recover from that fairly quickly. That's a good amount of time because we got you challenged. We got you a little bit into symptoms and doing some stuff, but then we're recovering quickly from that as well. And then maybe after a couple rest breaks or a couple other things you're going to do that day, you go for another half an hour walk. Same thing, you go up a little bit in symptoms, but when you come back, you get to rest and you can re recover quickly from that. So you're still getting your hour walk, you're just not getting it in one chunk. 
So that's a preferred activity pattern we're looking for. And so when we're in the green zone, when we're, when we're kind of doing our activities in a way that we're not getting a lot of symptoms, the green zone is like putting your kind of brain on ice. So it's cooling it down so it's not on fire anymore. And you can actually, you actually feel a lot better as well. And you can get more stuff done because you have less time recovering from what you're doing. I want everyone on the webinar that's listening today to think of rest as active therapy. When you're resting, you're doing, I want you to say, I'm doing my physio or my OT right now, I'm resting. It's not passive laziness, it is active therapy because that's gonna get your brain healed and on the right path to recovery. If we can keep, so I'm gonna go back a couple slides now, so don't mind me jumping around here. If we can do this, if we can keep to this kind of pattern of activity where we're not doing too, too much into the significant symptoms, we're challenging ourselves, but when we're getting a little bit of symptoms, but not too, too bad, what happens over time is that we end up with this kind of long-term activity goal. So you notice here, the symptom-free zone is a lot bigger now. So our brain has recovered a little bit. We're able to do a lot more for longer periods of time with shorter rest breaks in the middle, and then we can keep going. So this might look like a typical work day, maybe, where you start out in the morning, you do a lot of activity, have a lunch break in the middle, do a lot of activity, and then go home again and rest when you get home. So we're still aiming to be in the moderate or mild symptom zone, not the red zone. But you see how the mild and red, sorry, the yellow and the red zones here are a lot smaller than, than they were before. So that means that our brain is healing. It takes a lot more to get to that stage of having significant symptoms. Some of my patients even report, I forgot what it was like to have a headache like that because they pushed it way too far, even after they've been doing this kind of system for a while of pacing out activities. But really, that's what it comes down to. We need to pace out our activities and set limits. We need to limit those tasks that take a lot of energy or the tasks that increase the symptoms a lot. And pacing is really not doing too much at one time. You may still require rest at times. And we're going to talk about what rest really means. Um, rest does not necessarily have to be asleep. So it doesn't need to be a nap or laying down. It could be, but it doesn't have to be that. But the bottom line is we need to stop some of the activities that are really causing us a lot of kind of troubles and a lot of symptoms. So what is pacing? Not doing too many activities in one day or at one period of time. That could mean you build rest breaks into your day. For instance, maybe 15 minutes every hour you're doing a rest break. Um, the Pomodoro technique, which is where the tomato comes from, um, is doing 20 minutes on and 10 minutes off. So every half hour, it's a two to one ratio of doing activity and taking a rest break. Pacing could also be switching tasks or alternating the types of activities that you're doing. So it could mean switching from a thinking or cognitive task, which might be your banking, like your online banking, and then switching to a physical activity, like doing the dishes. So going back and forth between two different kinds of activities that might drain your batteries a little bit differently. I always recommend that patients really try hard to reduce activities that cause symptoms. It doesn't mean avoid them altogether. It means really pay attention to how you feel when you're doing those tasks and monitor and incorporate rest breaks into those activities. So that could include TV, computer, busy environments like Costco or a family function, like a family dinner perhaps. And then of course, we're always gonna encourage good routine, having good sleep patterns. So having some sleep hygiene if you're having struggles with sleep right now, a little bit of light exercise like walking, and of course, good nutrition as well. We wanna try and really focus in on those things. This is not pacing. So we kind of specialize at Parkwood in the type A people because they're always the type A plus, 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 multitaskers trying to do 10 bajillion things at once, but this is not pacing. Uh, and so pacing requires a huge lifestyle change. It's really hard for type A people to say the words no, and I can't, and help me. It's really, really a struggle and set limits with that, right? And so that's part of the the learning tonight, it will be learning how to set those limits. But you have to do something. So doing nothing all day is also not the answer to this problem either. Um, so we can't avoid all activity. It means we're going to plan out our activities so you're not doing too much at once. It is important to rest, but we can't stay in rest. Some patients are even told, rest until asymptomatic or rest until you feel better. What if you're six months out and you're still resting? That's not a great idea. That turns you into a mushroom because you're in a dark room usually, you're left alone, and you're not getting better. So doing nothing is not good either. But a lot of this, how to get back to doing activities again, is trial and error. It's trying to figure out what you can and what you cannot do 
And when you can do something again, what are, what are the limits for that activity? And how can you make it easier for yourself or to stay longer and challenge yourself as well? It's all about looking at the right amount of challenge as well. So if you think of the green circle as all the things you used to be able to do, everything you did, this is what you can do now, right? And people are like, oh, oh yeah, it's a lot less than what they used to be able to do. What I want you to do is activity in the red zone here. I want you guys to do a little bit more than what you can do now. So you're gonna challenge yourself in order to change the system. You can't start with the green circle, it's way too big, but we can't stay in the yellow either where it's safe and we have minimal symptoms. We have to challenge it to change it. And over time, what happens is that we can actually get that zone to increase as well. With the end goal, we're trying to bring it all the way out. Now, we don't know what the actual end goal will be in like, no one has a crystal ball with that, but the object is to aim for the outside circle with that. And really it comes down to the Goldilocks, trying to think about not too much, not too little, but just right. And that just right amount of activity will vary from day to day perhaps. It may vary if you didn't have a good night's sleep last night. You may not do the same amount of activity as you did the night before or the day before when you had a good night's sleep. So we're trying to kind of balance that out as we go through our days. So a lot of times what happens as well is that people think of rest as doing absolutely nothing. Now that could be, it could be doing absolutely nothing, looking at a wall, watching paint dry, and that is fine. A lot of times in the acute phases, what we recommend is go pet a dog. Don't do anything, look out a window and pet a dog because that is what you need to do for rest. So we can do a couple more things now, if, especially if you're in a kind of a prolonged or a chronic phase of this injury, we can do a lot more stuff. Um, but the idea is that rest, or restful activities are those things that do not exacerbate your symptoms or do not increase your symptoms. So these should be things that um, you can feel productive with or you can do relaxation activities, but they don't make you worse. They don't make you feel more rotten. Um, so again, some of the recommendations are to switch tasks. Again, usually it's away from a screen or a thinking task. So switching away from a cognitive activity to a more physical or doing activity. I usually recommend that patients could listen to something versus watching something. Um, so instead of watching TV, could you listen to a favorite movie? Instead of reading a book with your eyeballs, could you listen to a book on an audiobook or listen to a podcast instead? Some patients embrace gentle, mild yoga, a little bit of light walking or exercise. That could be a restful activity because, again, it could be a physical thing to give your cognitive brain a little bit of a break. Um, some people have even taken up Tai Chi. Some patients um, like to do meditation or mindfulness and relaxation activities, because that will help also de-stress. Some patients take up leisure activities. So we have a lot of people who have um, taking up doing yarn activities, doing the grown-up coloring books now, hobbies, art. We have a lot of artistic people that come out of their shell when they're trying to do rest activities because it can be something very creative that doesn't flare you up that bad. Sleeping and napping, if necessary. If you need to every single day have a nap between 1 and 3 p.m., then have your nap. If that's what gets you through the day and helps you function. The problem is you can't nap all day. So if you're in the stage of napping all day long, that's not a good solution to this problem either. And really what we're trying to look at is that we have limited gas in the tank. The brain only has so much usable energy per day. You used to have this little extra jerry can in the back in the trunk to use if you had to. So you know those busy, busy days before your injury where if you ran over, you kind of had this little reserve tank that you could draw from? That reserve tank is gone. You do not have a reserve. When the bell dings that you're out of gas, you need to fill up quickly. Tasks are also very much a lot harder than before. So more energy is going to be used per task. So not only is your tank not running on a lot of gas or there's no reserve tank, you're driving a gas guzzler now. So the gas gets used a lot faster. It's burning through it a lot quicker. So what kinds of things cause your brain to guzzle more gas? So I want you to keep in mind that when you're doing activities, if any of these things come into play with your activities, they're going to make that activity harder and they're also going to make it so you actually run out of energy faster. So things that involve talking, especially in a crowded or busy environment with background noise. If you're trying to have a conversation with someone um, and there's background noise talking, like especially at a party or at a function where there's a crowd around, that's gonna drain your tank really, really fast. Any activity in a high stimulation environment as well. 
anything that's bright, colorful, and moving, like the grocery store, Costco, outdoor events, malls. Um, I have a lot of teachers on my caseload, the schools in the hallway when the class lets out and all the kids are in the hallway kind of rummaging around making noise. Those things are really, really hard. Those are really big gas guzzling activities. So anything with a high visual stimulation as well, going to the movies or watching TV on a big screen, we're, we're not, we're so used to the little screens from before, right? Our brains, it's like they can't even handle the big screens anymore. Any kind of driving activity, it requires a high amount of focus and multitasking. But even if you're a passenger, your gas tank is going to drain that much faster when you're in the car and moving because you're moving around, looking around, and observing the environment in your, when you're in, as a passenger as well. And then a lot of cognitive activities as well, especially things that are high stakes. And high stakes things are things that usually are tied to some sort of financial thing. So if you need to fill out um, a form for the government to see about getting a disability tax credit or filling out an insurance form, those kinds of things are high stakes. You don't want to mess them up. So they're going to take extra focus, extra brain energy, and they're going to be extra difficult and take a lot of extra gas as well in the tank. The number one way to pace if you're trying to look at pacing out your activities is to use a timer. So a timer is the way, because your brain probably isn't monitoring time very well, a timer is a way to externalize or outsource that kind of internal clock that you used to have and let you know when time has passed. A timer should be used for any of those tasks that are big energy consumers or those gas guzzlers. So if you're doing a task that causes you a lot of symptoms or you're really, really tired and fatigued after doing them, the timer will be a good idea to try out with those bigger tasks. I recommend as well with a timer that you have a nag feature on that. Um, because what happens is if we don't have a, a nag feature, you turn off the timer saying, I'm just gonna do one more minute, just finish off this email or read to the end of the chapter. And then you forget that you've turned it off and a half an hour goes by. So a nag feature that will beep at you if you don't address it, address the timer, can be really, really helpful. I want you to try and set the timer for a sub-symptomatic amount of time. So for instance, if your symptoms come on after 30 minutes, when you're on the computer, set the timer for 25 minutes and try and get out while it's going good, right? Don't do one more email. If the timer goes off, walk away and come back later to it. Timers also allow for a starting point. A lot of our patients will procrastinate activities that seem very big and daunting because they used to be able to get them all done in one fell swoop. They used to be able to do a task and just kind of nose the grindstone, get through it, take an hour and it's done. But now you have to split things up a little bit. So if you're struggling with getting started on an activity, you could use a timer as well to get you started on things. So I will do this task for 10 minutes, see how I feel, and then I'll see how much I get done as well. So it gets you into the task. It's also, it's also an escape route out of the task and lets you do smaller portions. You really want to conserve your gas. And not only do we want to kind of keep an eye on those activities that are big gas guzzlers, why don't we make the big gas guzzling activities not so gas guzzling? right? Not so difficult. So for instance, if you're having a conversation with someone at a family function, why don't you move to a different room where you can hear them better versus trying to filter out the background noise of other people talking and trying to have that conversation. So if you can remove distractors, so there's less filtering involved, that is one number one thing you can, you can do. If you find you're light sensitive, adjust your screens to lower levels of brightness. It might buy you some more time on the computer. Prepare before you go to a busy store. For instance, before you go to the grocery store, have a list ready. Do some mindfulness or meditation in the car before you go in, right? Especially if the drive to the grocery store was hard. If you have to, use physical aids to help. So for instance, some people wear sunglasses or a hat in a bright store. I recommend that all my patients use a cart all the time in a store because it helps with their balance. And maybe only go for a short amount of time. Right, so to conserve the gas, instead of going to Christmas dinner for six hours, maybe you go for two hours where you have dinner and dessert and then you're out. Um, and then always breaking tasks into smaller chunks to allow for a shorter duration can really, really help with this. So instead of doing a giant task for four hours, maybe do eight 30 minute sessions instead and you can stagger them throughout the week. The thing with pacing is it sounds great on in theory, right? Pace out your activities, don't do much at one time, and really try and keep track of what's causing you to have symptoms and what's not. The problem is, is that we also need to plan our lives out, right? So having a plan or planning go really hand in hand with pacing as well. I usually recommend that if you're going to try and do pacing activities, you have to plan your life. You have to plan out your day. Um, so having a daily planner is a lot 
it makes it a lot easier. Um, patients who try and do it in their head typically end up with a planner anyway, so it's usually just better just to start with the planner. And if you're looking at a daily planner, I usually prefer uh, patients to use a system where they can see the entire week at a time. And so like a daily planner, like a schedule book, will have the whole year and you get to see each week at one time. If you're tech savvy and you love your phones or your tablets and you want to use those as well, that's okay too. It just means more screen time. Uh, if you're going to use paper, I, I recommend using pencil because you will need to change things around a little bit. They make lovely erasable pencil crayons now um, and erasable um, ink, like gel ink pens as well. So Staples has all your stationary needs. You can get your planner and your gel pens that are erasable and your erasable colored pencils and all that stuff there. And bring it with you. You need to bring your daily planner everywhere you go because you're going to be referring to it multiple times a day. It is your new best friend. So bring it with you and don't leave home without it, right? You wouldn't leave home without your phone, so don't leave home without your planner either. A weekly schedule may look like this, where it's gonna have little dividers for different times of the day, and it's gonna have the whole week at a time. So you can have a glance at the whole week. There's a reason why the day starts at seven and ends at 9.30, because we should probably be in a good sleep pattern here where we're getting up on time and going to bed on time as well. Um, if you find that you're a bit of a night hawk where you're up to one in the morning and sleeping in a little bit more, um, you could maybe make your own uh, weekly schedules or look for one online as well. So there's lots of options out there. Again, you Google it, there's lots of stuff out there to download for a weekly schedule. You can also use something as digital. So this is more of like an iPad tablet type schedule. Um, the good thing is with the digital versions that you can hit repeat. So patients who want to protect time, like their rest break time in the morning, they can hit repeat and that time will always be protected in their day. That way they don't schedule anything else at the same time. You can also color code things. Again, you can color code in, in a pencil based um, planner as well, but color coding can be really helpful because then certain things uh, will pop out at you. So things are going to kind of jump out and you'll, you won't miss a doctor's appointment this way. When you're looking at your schedule though, you're going to notice that there are many activities that you do. There's daily activities like taking a shower, getting dressed, eating, maybe going to work, getting the mail. There are things you do every week like laundry, garbage day, dusting, maybe monthly things like paying your taxes or giving your dog a heartworm medication. And maybe there's infrequent things as well like doctor's appointments, dentist appointments, washing the windows. Um, so there's lots of different things you, you can put into your weekly schedule that may not, it may not be the same thing every single week. So it's going gonna, it's gonna to mix up a little bit as you go along. It is really important to prioritize your activities as well. So when you are adding activities into your daily planner, you have to make sure that you prioritize so that the important stuff gets done first, right? Now this is not an excuse to get out doing housework. Nobody likes doing that, but we all have to do it. So I would unprioritize that if I could. Some people also run a to-do list. So they say, well, I have this list of things I want to get done. How does that work? How do, how do I incorporate that into my daily planner? So usually I recommend that if you're going to have a to-do list, plug your to-do items into your daily schedule. Make an appointment with yourself to wash the dishes. Make an appointment with yourself to pick up the kids from the bus stop. Make an appointment with yourself to go get the mail, right? So all those things you're going to put into your schedule. The idea is you're going to schedule every single thing you're doing throughout the day. That includes you're showering, you're brushing your teeth, you're making your meals. The easy, simple things that we're, you didn't have to think about before, we're going to add them into the schedule now because they're going to take energy, right? And doing too much in one day, we're noticing that we're getting lots of symptoms from that. Sometimes you're going to find that you have way too many things to do in one day. You may also start seeing patterns where you can group activities together. So for instance, my post office and my pharmacy are in the same building. So I'm going to go once and get both things done versus take two separate trips. Sometimes you're going to need to say no. Sometimes you're going to look at your schedule and say, ho, ho, I can't do that. I'm going to say no to this person or that person. And it might be disappointing for them, but it's to help save your symptoms from coming on. And sometimes you might need to reprioritize things. Sometimes you're not going to get everything done. And that's okay too, because anything that's not done today may get transferred into another day as well. So I have some rules for the agenda use. So when you're going to use a daily planner or an agenda, it's important that you follow kind of a base set of rules here. So um, that rule number one is you will have to write down all your activities. So we just talked about how you have to write down every single thing you're doing, the little things, the big things, everything, not just your doctor's appointments. You have to check your agenda every day to see what you have to do. So some people do it the night before, some people do it during breakfast, but you're gonna check it every day in the morning to see what you have to do today. 
And then you're going to check it throughout the day as well. Don't just look at it once in the morning and say, oh, I've got it. I'm going to memorize this. You don't have it. Or maybe you shouldn't have it. Outsource that, right? We want to free up some real estate in the brain power area. So try your best to use the planner as your outsourced memory for your activities. As you're looking at your agenda, you're going to record your activities that you're doing in your agenda. I also want you to put down symptoms that are occurring because we might start seeing a kind of a correlation or a pattern where every time I do this task, I start to get these symptoms. As you get new appointments, you're going to add them in as well. You also want to peek at yesterday's activities and transfer anything not finished into today or next week, perhaps. And free time, or I call it white space, is okay. Having blank spaces in your agenda is totally fine. But you probably do something during that time. You probably, it's not blank forever. You will end up doing something in that spot. So you have to log what you did. Let's say you have the whole afternoon where it's free time, there's nothing planned out, but then you watch two movies and then you have headaches. If we didn't log that, if we didn't write that movie in or the two movies in and then the symptoms with it, we won't really be able to figure out that's what caused the symptoms to come on. So I'm really gonna try and sell it to everyone here because I want you guys to get agendas. I do not have a stake in this. Dayminer does not pay me a kickback for every agenda that gets sold. I wish it did. Um, you know what day of the week it is. So when you have an agenda, you know what day of the week it is. If you're not at work every day sometimes, it's really hard to figure out what day is the weekend, what day is not. You know what you have planned for the day. So there's no surprises anymore. You know exactly what's going on and you can plan out your day accordingly around the important things that you're doing. You can schedule in needed rest breaks so you can protect time so that you don't overdo it and you can let your brain kind of recover and heal when you're going to high symptom zones. You can keep track of what you did that may have triggered symptoms. So it's your journal or your log, which you then can show to your doctor as well. And you can stay focused on the tasks at hand that need to get completed. So I have some patients who get distracted as they're doing activities as well. Their planner is what brings them back to the tasks they were supposed to be doing. So if that's uh, something that happens to you, then the planner can be something that you can actually help with staying focused on the tasks at hand. That way you don't get off track too far. I have a lot of patients who resist the planners though. Not as much anymore, but I find that some of them still resist the, the use of the planners. Um, they have various reasons for that. Some of them say, well, I'm not doing anything all day because of my symptoms, so I feel like I'm not gonna write anything in it. Uh, I usually say try it, because you'd be surprised at how much you are doing, that you don't realize that you're doing, that are causing symptoms perhaps. I have a lot of people who say that, that planners aren't cool, and I don't want people thinking I'm disabled, so they're trying really hard to, be, to appear normal or hide what's happening to them. Um, so I would say that might be a good time to put it into your phone perhaps. So instead of having a paper-based planner, having a, a phone-based calendar could be an option for you as well because everyone's allowed to go on their phones now. Um, so it doesn't seem like you're doing anything out of the ordinary. Um, I have some pa patients who say, I don't have a purse or I don't carry a bag with me. So where am I going to put it? Um, as you say, embrace, get, get a bag, get a backpack, get a purse if you have to. Uh, a side satchel, fanny packs are in now, I guess, as well. So um, get a planner maybe small enough to fit in something that you can bring with you. That's a good one also. Um, and my favorite is when patients say, I can keep it all in my head. I don't need a planner to write it down. I can just store it upstairs. Uh, I usually say, don't. Don't try and do that right now. We're trying to free up some brain cells. Um, so if you can outsource it into something paper-based or digital, then it makes it a lot easier for you to um, focus on the things you need to get done. Don't try and take up brain space with the planner. It can be outsourced. Most of my patients who embrace the use of a planner or agenda tend to have fewer symptoms sooner. They tend to start feeling better or they feel like they're more in control of their day as well, and they start to feel better sooner. And resistance is futile. So no matter where you go within our program with where I work, uh, all my colleagues, we all peer pressure our patients to get the planner because we know it works. And so we say, just get one now and just avoid the fight later on. So even after all this discussion, it seems very easy, right? You have a to-do list of activities. We have to pace out those activities so we don't get symptoms. And so having a plan or planning out your day is the best way to do that. But it's harder than it looks, especially if you're not used to doing it. So if you're not used to doing it, it's really, really challenging. So I'm going to tell you a little story. I had a patient who inspired me to think of a different way of pacing and planning. Um, about I'm going to say about eight years ago, um, he was an inpatient. So he, was, he stayed uh, at Parkwood as an inpatient for his rehab to start with. And then he was transferred to outpatients as part of his recovery journey. 
So when he was when he was on inpatients, he did really well because the therapist scheduled his day, made sure he had rest breaks, made sure he didn't do too much. Um, but when he went home, the control was on him now. And he struggled with trying to make sure he didn't do too much in one day. His fatigue was unbearable. He said, I would get throughout, I would get to three o'clock in the afternoon and hit a wall. It was like a phys, almost like a physical wall where he would hit this wall and feel like he could not even take one more step to even lay down on the couch. So I was treating him for quite a while and we were really struggling with trying to get um, some traction with pacing and planning. We were using the agenda book, but it really was, we really weren't getting very far. So I knew he was coming in on a Monday morning and I thought, uh oh, I am out of ideas. I don't have anything else new to tell him. I'm, I think I'm going to discharge him because I think we're not, we're not really getting anywhere and I have no new ideas. So the Sunday night before I thought, wow, there has to be something we can do. What if there's, there's a special diet you can do where you use a point system to help track your calories that you're intaking. So every food you eat has a, has a point value and then you get a max number of points. And the idea is to help kind of look at how much you're eating and how much you're doing so that you're not overdoing it or overeating throughout the day. So I thought maybe what I could do is give him almost like an activity diet where every activity he's doing has a point system, kind of like that Weight Watchers point system, um, but it's based on activities, not kind of food products instead. And then we'll give him a limit as to how much he can eat or consume or consume with activity per day. So his response was, Becky, nothing else is working, so let's try it, right? So he was, he was right on board. He's like, we're, we're going to give it a shot, no problem. And the idea is that every activity that he was doing, we gave it a point value. And it was based on how difficult the task was and how much symptoms it cost. And then we capped him. We gave him a maximum number of points per day. And it worked well because it provided a very simple, structured way of tracking activities. It provided a framework for limiting tasks. It allowed him to say, I can't do that right now because I'm out of points. Or I know I want to do this thing in the evening. That's going to take a lot of points, so I can't burn them all off throughout the day and not have anything left. It got rid of the guessing game. He didn't have to try and figure out, am I going to pay for this later or not? It gave a bit of a concrete limit to his activities. And then a lot of them say no as well. So he was able to say, no, I can't do that with you tonight because I'm out of points and stop an activity without any kind of guilt. So he basically, he made it so that he, did, he wasn't saying no, the points were saying no. Basically, he was out of um, his activity points for the day. So at first, like I was mean to him, so I only gave him 10 points per day. I've learned my lesson. Um, so patients are now given about 15 to 20 points per day. And activities are given a point value based on the level of difficulty and the symptom provocation. So how many symptoms it causes and how hard that task is, is where we give the points to. And then they have to plan out their day to ensure they have enough points to do all the things they want to get done within their maximum. So a lot of my patients and a lot of my colleagues and some other like therapists in the community are like, how are you getting these numbers? Like, how do you just make them up? Um, so part of it was, it was a bit of experience. So I knew what tasks were hard for my patients. So how complex the activities were. Um, does it require a lot of cognition or thinking? How much stimulation is gonna be involved with it? So are they going to be hammered with noise and light stimulation or is it gonna be fairly quiet where they're going? Um, the amount of talking involved, the amount of filtering involved how much visual processing was involved with the activities. And then again, it's, it was more of kind of a gut instinct. So we would go through activities together and try and figure out what were hard and what was easy. However, we have smartened up now. So we have math to help you out with this. So the mathematical equation is to figure out how many points, and this is kind of a guesstimate, right? So you have to kind of play it by ear with this one a little bit, um, but it comes out pretty good. So you have to ask yourself when you're looking at an activity, let's say the activity is grocery shopping, okay? So how difficult is that task out of 10? Let's say it's a six out of 10. And how symptom provoking is it out of 10? So let's say it's uh, four out of 10. So it's more difficult than symptom provoking. And then you add the six, which is the X, plus the Y, which is the four, and you get Z, which is 10. So 10 divided by four, is two and a half. So going to the grocery store would cost you two and a half points. Now, if you were 10 out of 10 on difficulty and 10 out of 10 on symptoms, 
that would end up being 20 divided by four, which is a five, which is more typical for my patients that I see. So usually the grocery store or Costco is the evil of all the evil places. And so a five is usually what we score for a grocery shopping with that. So the math should help you. We're trying to figure out those points. And then as you start to limit the tasks, your symptoms will start to improve likely. But like any food diet, this is not a temporary thing, but a lifestyle change, so be prepared. It's gonna be hard to stick with it once the change starts happening. Once you start to recover, maybe your points will change as well. So don't do this the first week. You wanna wait one to two weeks before you start changing anything up. What you could do to change the points is either give yourself extra points per day. So instead of having 15 to 20, now you maybe have 17 to 22. Or you could look at your activities. Maybe the activities aren't costing you as many points anymore. Maybe a grocery store is not a five anymore. Maybe now it's only a four. So you're saving points by doing that. But every activity that you do has points. So here's just kind of a, a, an idea of certain activities. Um, the hockey game part, just to put it out there, um, is attending a hockey game, not playing in one. Okay, so no hockey. Um, and these are just kind of estimates as to what other patients usually report as this is how many points it costs. Um, some things are time limited as well. So TV use is per hour. Uh, computer use, reading, those kinds of things, is per, there's a time limit for those things. And then if you look at the eating at a restaurant, eating out at a restaurant, it's five points if you go with one other person. So there's just two of you, it's five points because there's a lot of noise, there's a lot of stimulation, there's a lot of filtering involved. Every additional person you put at the table with you, you have to add a point. So it gets harder and harder and costs you more and more points the more people are at the table. Okay, use the points to get here. Use it to stay in that mild to moderate symptom zone so you're not going overboard every single day into the significant symptoms where your brain's on fire. But every task needs to be accounted for. So each task has a point value. Yes, showering has a point value, brushing your teeth has a point value, making your lunch has a point value, everything. Even watching TV. TV is, people use this, like again, when you have the flu and you're at home sick, you're gonna watch TV all day, right? But now TV is not an easy thing. It's not a passive thing. It's a, it takes a lot of brain energy. So TV watching will take points. Depending on where you are in recovery, a nap could you give you negative points, like a minus two, but you only get to do this once a week. So let's say on Saturday night you want to go out to a restaurant and you need to earn a couple points back. If you don't usually nap and you nap that day to kind of recharge yourself, you can give yourself two points back. But I exercise caution with all of this because people take advantage of the negative points. So don't go hog wild with this. I also recommend that it's better to plan ahead. So if you are going to tally up every single thing you're doing per day, it's better to plan ahead and know when you're gonna go over or know that you're in a good zone of points for the total versus, oops, I went over, oops, oops, because that doesn't change you, right? You're still going over. So planning ahead is the better option. So now that you're points experts, you can start tracking your activities that you're doing in your planner and your symptoms and start giving points values to your tasks. Tally them up. See which days are high point days. See which days are the, if they're the same as the high symptom days and start to plan your days based on your activities that are priorities. So if you have activities that are priorities, those have to go in first. And if they're fivers out of 10 or five out of 15, that's a lot of points. So you have to make sure you kind of budget those out. So you're on the road to recovery now that you're pacing and planning and you will most likely pace and plan for a long time. And there are other ways to do this. So there's many different ways you can do pacing. Pacing points is not the only way to manage this. Some people you know, like to think of it more of a pacing budget. So they'll kind of use dollar amounts for their uh, point values versus a diet or a Weight Watchers kind of analogy, or they use tokens instead. Um, it's whatever works best for you. So if you, if you find that you can't stick with it, enlist your family members to help you if you can, get everyone on board, right? So this is, it's a great little system to try out if you can. A lot of my patients prefer this kind of system instead. So it's the same, it's still a point system, but it's kind of the reverse where you categorize all the high point value activities together in the reds column. You only get to do one of those per day. And then the medium or two to three point activities out of five, um, meal preparation, the, the kind of medium symptom and medium difficulty activities, you get to just do two or three of those per day. And then in the green section are the unlimited ones, or you get to do five plus. So those are the easy things. So rest and those kinds of things are in that green activities as well, right? So I even had one patient who she wanted to be really on the ball with doing her, her this kind of system, this menu, that she used to wear hair elastics around her wrist. One red, 
two or three yellows, and five greens. And when she did a task, she'd take the hair elastic off her wrist. So she ran out. So every morning she would load them up and then she would take them off so that they would, she would have a good count as to what the, and then she also figured out that two yellows equal a red or two yellows and a green equal a red. So she could do two red things if she paid it with the other kind of system. So it's, it's so much like a budget where you're not going over with that. So who should try using the point system? People who are doing way too much and having trouble managing their symptoms. So these are the type A++ plus 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 push through, not stopping, they should use a point system to hold them back a little bit. And then it doesn't, it doesn't stay like that forever. So you're not held back forever. It's temporary until you start feeling better. And then we start inching you up again. People who are not doing enough. So people who are mushrooms, who are kind of stuck in that rest activity and they, they're kind of fearful of starting activities again. And they're really having like, there's some anxiety involved with setbacks and symptom provocation this would be a good system to get them started again. We need to go move up to the certain amount. Um, patients, again, my patient who inspired this program, um, he was a delayed onset kind of person. So he wouldn't get the symptoms to the next day. So people who have delayed onset of symptoms, have a, they, they do really well with this program because they have trouble deciding how much is too much. And this allows them to set limits in, in an easy way. So you're gonna start the journey with pacing and planning. So this is, a, if, even if you're halfway through your journey, even if you're just starting, even if you're at the end, pacing and planning can still help along the, the road to recovery for you. But you're also gonna finish the journey with pacing and planning. So you can't stop as soon as you start feeling a little bit better, right? So I have a lot of patients who chuck this program out the window, like, thanks, Becky. And then I'm, they come back a couple weeks later and like, oh, I'm back on the program because I stopped doing it, then I started doing way too much, and now I feel rotten again. So they usually, usually we say, you're gonna start with pacing and planning and finish with pacing and planning. And you may, again, you may even like having a planner and doing the system like this that you may never want to give it up either. Ha ha, maybe not, I don't know. Okay, so thank you so much for all your time tonight. Um, there are some questions, so I'm gonna read a 